Good morning again. My name is Pastor Steve Robinson, one of our associate pastors here, if I've not formally met you. Um, it is the fourth week in our summer Bible study series, Back to the Basics, as well as our Wednesday night accompanying series and our Purple Book Challenge. So if you've not joined us yet for Wednesday night or our Purple Book Challenge, you still have time. Summer's not over yet. For those of you who are keeping count as well, it's the fourth week in a row that we haven't seen Pastor Brian in the pulpit. Have no fear, he will be back next week, but he's had some well-deserved time off, time with his family, time traveling um, around the world a little bit as well. But we'll see him back next week. But today, I have the privilege of continuing our series. Um, we're week four. We'll be paralleling chapter four and the purple book. And I've chosen a passage today to talk about the Holy Spirit um, out of John chapter 14, verses 12 to 17. So it will come up on the screens. I'll be reading from the NIV or the New International Version of the Bible. So let's read this together. Or let me read this for us. We're starting in verse 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I've titled this message, The Spirit's Presence and Power in the Life of the Believer. The Spirit's Presence and Power. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that today we have the opportunity to look in your word and to see this foundational principle about the Holy Spirit, who you are, how you work in our life. Teach us today, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before I get into looking at this passage, can you put up that picture for me? All right. I need a little audience help here, so I'm going to take a little poll. Uh, you probably know what I'm going to ask, but how many of you would say this is clearly a glass that is half full? How many folks here? Okay, so majority of you in the room are what we call optimists, right? How many of you said, no, 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 this is clearly a half-empty kind of a glass? Yeah, only a handful of people who are willing to actually admit they're more on the pessimistic side. Well, these are not the only two frameworks, I think, for seeing this. You may say, like me, that's clearly a glass of water. It's neither half full nor half empty. It's just a glass of water. We will be called realists. Amen? All right. So a realist, I've actually was given a prophetic word about 10 years ago saying that I had the spiritual gift of reality. I'm not sure how that really works, but you know what? I'm about as grounded, I think, as, as you can get. So let me, a little more definition of what a realist might do since we have a lot of optimists and a very few pessimists here. A realist strives for a balanced view of situations considering both positives and negative aspects. We also base our perceptions on facts, oftentimes more so than emotion or how we feel about things. So maybe that fits you. Maybe you need to revise your impression of what that actually is on the screen. Now, a related question. Um, how many of you would say that your framework, optimism, pessimism, whatever, got worse? Your, your outlook went darker during the pandemic, lockdowns, all of the things like that. My kids would tell me that their generation for Gen Z's, everybody universally got much worse. Maybe some of us older folks who've lived through a little more life experience, um, that collective trauma didn't affect us quite as much. But a lot of the younger generations really took a turn for the negative. Now, thankfully, some of them are coming back some, but that's just the reality of what we've lived through in these last couple of years. Why do I ask these kind of things? The reality is in life, the way we look at the world, our perspective, our framework, it's not right or wrong sometimes, but it does affect how we operate together, whether it's on a sports team or maybe at your job. Someone who is kind of more of an optimist on a team or a sport, that they can foster hope, maybe resilience, they can bring motivation to a team. Whereas the pessimist, they can contribute critical thinking skills, helping a team to prepare for potential setbacks that inevitably happen. Meanwhile, us realists, we bring more of a balanced, pragmatic approach to many situations along the way. Each can bring value to the whole. Now, in the Purple Book, 
that we've been going through, out of chapter 4 that we're looking at this week, there's a key phrase in here that I think is going to set the tone for what we're doing today. It says this, it's, quote, it is impossible to live the Christian life apart from the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Now, for my pessimists, the few of you in the room, immediately your tendency is to go, impossible. I knew it was impossible to live holy, to live for Jesus, to love my enemies, to do all these things. Clearly, it's impossible. Now, my optimists reject the whole statement. You're like, I'm clearly favored and highly blessed along the way. Don't tell me that I'm not or that anything's impossible. This is the way it is. I see things different than you do. Now, us realists might say something and take this double negative in that phrase to say, it is possible to live the Christian life only abiding in the presence and operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, so we can take how you view those things, it can definitely color how we approach the truth of Scripture. And today, I want to look at this foundational truth of what kind of Christian life is possible because of the Spirit's involvement in our life. Are you guys ready to go on that kind of a journey with me? All right, so let's go back to our passage out of John 14. The setting here is it's the Last Supper. This is Jesus himself teaching his disciples. He's about to be handed over to be crucified within 24 hours, and he's giving them final instructions. And he says this, I'm going to start in verse 15 and work my way back. If you love me, keep my commands. Now John says this a lot in our last sermon series on 1 John. We heard a lot about obedience to God equals obeying his command. That's how we prove that we love him. So keeping his commands is important. And verse 16, and I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. Pause for a second. That idea of another advocate. Now that word advocate, in the Greek it's the word parakletos, which actually means helper, or the one who comes alongside to help. It can be translated comforter, counselor, helper. So here, the Father's going to give us the Holy Spirit as a comforter and a counselor, but he's another advocate. Who's our first advocate? Well, if you look in the Old Testament, there's a picture prophetically out of the book of Zechariah where God himself is the advocate for his people. I want you to see this in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Then he, the angel, showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. What a scene. We have Satan, the prosecutor, here accusing this priest, Joshua, who's not dressed in the clothes he's supposed to be dressed in, and we have the angel of the Lord as the judge seated in this courtroom drama. Some people in the Old Testament refer to this angel of the Lord. Sometimes it can be an actual angel. Other times it's a representation of God himself. So here we are. God and his angel are on the throne, Satan and God's people. But the Lord actually rebukes Satan. Even though Satan's prosecuting the case, this man is dirty. He can't come before God in these filthy rags. That's not the right attire. And yet God says, hey, I've chosen him, Satan. Take off those dirty rags. Replace it. Take away his sin. And instead, put clean clothes on him, that he be righteous before me. God advocated on behalf of his people, despite Satan's accusations that came. Now, in the New Testament, Paul tells us there's actually another advocate as well. In Romans 8, verse 34, Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of the God and is also interceding for us. Even today, Jesus, the resurrected Christ in heaven, interceding on your behalf, on my behalf. He is standing, praying for us, speaking truth over us, declaring God's will and plans over your and my life. He's advocating for us. But now, Jesus, because he's in heaven, he can't be here at our side. And what did he do? He said, I will send you another advocate. To do what? To help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. Notice he's not called the spirit of love, the spirit of righteousness, the spirit of joy. He's the spirit of truth. 
The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Now that's new. See, in the, in the Old Testament times before Jesus, the Holy Spirit, he would come, he would, like a pillar of fire, a, a pillar of cloud, he would come and empower individuals like prophets or craftsmen to do things like build the Ark of the Covenants, but he wouldn't come live inside of God's people individually. It was only a special person, a special time, and then his spirit oftentimes would leave. But now Jesus is saying, there's something new going to happen. Once I ascend to the Father, I'm going to send this helper, the advocate, the one that comes alongside, and he's going to be in you and with you. Ezekiel 36 prophesied this in verse 26 and 27. He said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. It's not just that we would have the Ten Commandments and we would somehow have to, this external force to conform our life to make us holy. God says, I'm going to put my spirit in you to then move you to follow my decrees. See, coming to Jesus doesn't mean that we have it all perfect and our life is perfectly right and then God accepts us. No, God says, I accept you because of Jesus and now I'm going to put my spirit and now you're going to follow me and obey my commands because you love me. That's how we got into a relationship to begin with. See the difference? It's not a religious life. It's a relational life with God the Father. So, my first point today, what is possible with his presence? Well, we have an antidote for loneliness. An antidote for loneliness. Did you know that according to the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, that we have a epidemic of loneliness in America right now? A couple months ago, this advisory came out from the Department of Health and Human Services, which talks about a public health advisory to what loneliness is doing in our culture. In summary, this is how they describe this, what they found. Quote, loneliness and isolation increase the risk for individuals to develop mental health challenges in their lives, and lacking connection can increase the risk for premature death to levels comparable to smoking daily. Being lonely, being disconnected, not a part of community is bad for your health. Most of us know, finally, after many decades of the truth about what smoking actually does to us, how, how it affects us, our physical health, loneliness is just as bad as smoking packs of cigarettes a day. It's especially bad amongst our young people today. That lack of authentic human connection, isolation, probably at levels never seen before. Now, this is despite the promise that we had from the internet, from social media, all these things that say, hey, you've got all these connections you can have at your fingertip, you've got tons of people you can look at, and yet we're even more lonely than ever before. Clearly, technology is not the antidote. Whether it's part of the problem or not is still being debated. But how does the Holy Spirit, how is his presence an antidote for loneliness? Well, Jesus promised his disciples, but also all future believers, which includes us in this room, that God's presence through his Spirit indwelling us and being with us, he would always be present with us. That means you can never be alone when God's Spirit is with you, unless you choose to ignore his presence. I don't know, I'm not going to put my kids on blast here on the front row, but have you ever had anybody that has been wearing noise-canceling headphones in the room with you? And yet you're talking to them, and it's like they're on, literally on another planet. They're, even though you're sitting proximal, you're not really with them, right? Well, the Holy Spirit is with me. I can choose to cancel him out and not listen to his presence. I can choose to feel like he doesn't care for me, like he doesn't, isn't with me. But it doesn't make it true that he's here. He is here with us. We as Americans, we love our independence, don't we? We just celebrated Independence Day last week. We also love our individualism. So this sounds pretty amazing that the God of the universe will be with me. Just me and God. I can link arms, me and the Holy Spirit, and we're going to do this Christian life, right? Just us, amigos. I don't need anybody else. I got God. Is that what he's referring to by God with us? Well, there is an individual component. Holy Spirit living in me. But turns out, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, 
Paul describes it a little bit differently. He says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? See, that, some of the translations will say God's spirit dwells in you. We oftentimes think that's me he's talking about. No, that you is plural. The idea of God's spirit doesn't just dwell in me. He dwells in his church, in his people. Now, that's not just this building that, I'm, that we gather in on Sunday mornings. And praise God that we have a place that we can come together as his people, as his body, and we can gather. And as our worship team did an amazing job today, we experience God's presence collectively together. Not just because of this building is somehow super special or it's somehow sanctified in a way that no, it's God's people gathering together, the church, that his body, that his spirit comes and dwells and moves in our midst in a greater way than he ever could do with just me and God. Worshiping him in my shower or listening to some worship songs in the car, that can be great at times, but it's not the same and it's not a substitute for God's people collectively worshiping together. Amen? God's body is important. Did you know, to feel accepted, many folks today seem to think that to be accepted in a group, to, be, to find connection and belonging, I have to find an ever narrower slice of people that are just like me to truly belong. People with the same political views, the same sexual attractions, the same music tastes, the same exercise habits. You name it, we've got a group that specializes for you and people just like you. But that's not the way it's meant to be with the church, where we all have to be exactly the same in our own little piece. And it turns out, God says in the church, the body is meant to be diverse. The body is meant to have different parts with different functions, with different gifts and different skills. The hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. The eye can't say to the ear, I'm good. You just stay over there. We need one another. We need the giftings and the diversity of perspectives and experience in life. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about this and he says, we are all baptized by one spirit as to form one body. Whether Jew or Greek, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Because of the spirit moving in us, we're connected, even if we're different. And that's part of God's plan. But what are some of the things that keep people even gathered in a place like this? Being a part of the church, many times people still feel rejected. They still feel disconnected. They still feel alone, despite what God is doing in his people. Well, sometimes it's petty people, cliques that form, gossip, sinful stuff that keeps people from connecting, and that's wrong, clearly. God doesn't want that, and there's no perfect group of people, despite what may look like on the surface, we're kind of perfect. No, we're not perfect here, right? We're made, church is made up of people that are still working out their salvation and sanctification is happening as God grows those things in us. But it turns out there's actually spiritual forces out there the enemy wants to divide you. He wants to divide us. He wants to keep us isolated. He wants people to feel rejected, like they can't connect. They don't belong. In fact, there's a real spirit of rejection that is very strategic. If he can keep you isolated, if he can send you off by yourself so you're not actually a part of what God's doing, guess what? It's so much easier for the wolves to pick off those that are on their own than it is somebody who's in the collection and the, and the safety of God's people together. Reject that spirit of rejection. Maybe you've been burned, maybe you've been rejected by a romantic interest, or maybe even something worse, your family, a parent, even a spouse that says, you know what, I'm just not in love with you anymore. I don't want to be together. Those are very real, and those hurt. And some people, it seems like their whole life is a series of rejections. I'm here to tell you today, by faith, God's spirit living in us as we are followers of Christ, as we're believers, he doesn't reject us. He calls us to himself. He joins us to his body that we can belong. We're not alone anymore. Speaking of alone, I went to the thesaurus.com, if you ever use that. Guess how many synonyms there are for that word alone in the English language? Well, I'm sure you looked it up last week, but there's 36, in case you were wondering. 36 different words that we've come up with in the English language to describe that idea of being alone. Now, on the other extreme, the antonym of alone, how many words do you think there are in the English language that are the opposite of alone? Turns out there's one, the word together. Fascinating. 36 words to describe being alone, lonely, those kind of things. In only one to describe its opposite. 
It's being together. One of our pillars over here on the wall, diversified and unified. God's called us to live life, not in all the different ways you can be alone, in all the different ways you can be isolated, with our diversity to be unified together as members of his body. Aren't you glad that Jesus puts us together? Amen. God wants us to be his people that reflect who he is. The antidote to our epidemic of loneliness is the presence of the Spirit in my life and in our lives together as our advocate, our helper, the one who defends us when the lies of the enemy and the attacks come to tell us that we're not good enough, that we don't belong, and the rest. What is another thing that the Spirit makes possible with His presence? Well, it turns out we have the antidote for disinformation. The last few years have been quite the fear, right, of disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, all kinds of bad things that we're told to, to fear, whether it's around elections or COVID or UFOs or deep fakes, you name it, there's plenty of things that you can find out there on the internet. But if I read it on the internet, doesn't that make it true? What if my feelings, I feel like this is true. Does that make it true? How do we know what is true? Well, that question, what is truth, in fact, was asked a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, within 24 hours of Jesus giving these instructions to his disciples, when Pilate was interrogating Jesus, deciding whether to crucify him or not, he said, what is truth? Well, it's a pretty timeless question, apparently. Our culture today, I'm not sure we're any closer, in fact, we might be farther away than even Pilate was back then. Jesus answered Pilate in verse 37 of John 18. Jesus said, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Whoa, that's pretty definitive. Jesus testified to the truth, and if you're on team truth, you're going to listen to Jesus. Practically, how does that work? Well, Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. He's living in us. The Holy Spirit will work within us to speak truth to us. However, he'll also never contradict his revealed word through the scriptures. Let me say that again. How do I know if I'm, I'm listening to the Spirit? Well, is it lining up with the Word? Because if what I think I'm hearing from God is opposite of what the scriptures teach, that can't be the Holy Spirit. See, He never, the Spirit inspired the Word, revealed the Word to us. He's not going to speak out of both sides of His mouth. We have to know His Word. Now, this is where many Christians kind of get off track. They spend much more time I'm not so sorry if I'm going to step on some toes here. Much more time listening to other voices, maybe doom scrolling on their devices, than they do word scrolling in their Bibles. How many of us, the quantity of the voices we hear, who are we listening to as evidenced by our time spent? We need more word in us. When that happens, John 14, 26 Jesus said, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. If we've never heard about what Jesus said, if we've never read it for ourselves, how can he remind us of things we've never heard? If you live in a, a country that's closed, where you can't get Bible, you can't get apps, all the free resources, the Holy Spirit oftentimes will speak to those folks and reveal himself in a way that we don't have the excuse here in our culture. We have thousands of Bibles free online. We have all kinds of resources. It's just what we choose to listen or not. For my optimists in the room, you are stoked that it's possible to hear God's voice. Yes, <laughs> I can hear God's voice. I can clearly hear as the Spirit speaks through the Scriptures and as He speaks to me, I got this. He's with me. For my pessimists, I can hear your frustration too. Your experience tells you it's hard to hear God's voice. How do I really listen to Him and know it's Him? How do I know it's not just my internal monologue confusing me or telling me what I want to hear? Well, it might be you. It might be the Spirit. But it turns out there's also a third voice that vies for our attention, the accuser. The enemy is lying to us all the time as well. John 8, 44, Jesus said about Satan, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Did you know every thought that pops into your head isn't necessarily from you? 
or God. The enemy is always throwing darts our way, throwing lies. You're not good enough. You'll never amount to anything. These people here see right through you. They'll never bring you into their fellowship. Those are common thoughts. Maybe you've heard things like that around God's people. An old phrase says, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. The enemy is going to throw stuff at us all the time. The question is, do we let them rest in our mind? Do we take those things that said and say, huh, that's an interesting thought. Maybe nobody will like me. Maybe they're all different. Maybe I'm just an outlier here. Maybe they're all just fake and pretending. And I grab a hold of that, and I start mulling and chewing on that, and I start to believe the lies. As opposed to what Paul tells us, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Every lie, everything that pops in, whether it's from the enemy or from me, hey, it's all going to the feet of Jesus. In fact, sometimes in my mind, I will imagine, no, nope, that lie, I stick it in a box, and I push it at Jesus' feet, and let him stomp it, and put that lie where it deserves to be, under my feet. See, we need the truth to live. What God says about me, the Holy Spirit helps me to understand. He's an antidote for the lies and disinformation, everything else. Maybe you've heard a phrase I came across yesterday. It's pretty new. People ask me afterwards, where'd you see that? It's theoretically some new version of a self-help technique where if you're having a bad day, if you're kind of uncharged, if you just need to kind of wallow maybe for a little season, it's called bed rotting. Anybody heard? Oh, somebody's heard of that? Bed rotting. Doesn't sound very therapeutic to me, it rotting anything around, but apparently one goes in one's bed and kind of under the covers and we just kind of start scrolling or binge watching or just kind of not get out and just, the whole point is just to rot, whatever that means. <laughs> um, well, we could build, sometimes that, it's maybe it's different than, as an introvert, it's different than recharging after a busy day, after a party or a stressful event with a lot of people, I just need to recharge. That just the idea of, I'm just scrolling through things and meaningless things that are popping through my head constantly. That's not real self-help. That can easily spiral into a, a death spiral, right, of negativity, and I can find myself down a rabbit hole into a lot of dark places. That's not what God's called us to do. God's called us to not just hear those negative things and be led down a trail, to say no. Self-help is really, I'm spending time in the Word, hearing what God says about me, allowing God to, to build my spirit, not self-help, but Holy Spirit help as the advocate. Too much self-help, not enough Holy Spirit help to help us become people of the truth. Amen? Remember, there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. If all you hear is the voice of condemnation and negativity, we need to reject that. That's the voice of the enemy. But our feelings and our thoughts, those are also not the barometer of what is true. Did you know Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure? Who can understand it? Follow your heart. Sounds like great relational advice or career advice, but oftentimes my heart will lead me right off a cliff <laughs> into a very bad place. Well, that's my unredeemed heart. See, if my heart that's been, when, when I'm born again, my heart doesn't just, my old emotions that center my will and the things that make me me, it doesn't just go away, but now I have a new heart. And now I, that, remember that Ezekiel says, that new spirit in me. My old heart isn't gone, though. I have to choose each day. Am I going to walk according to the spirit? Oh, I'm going to walk according to my flesh, that old me that can lead me, my feelings and things, astray from what he says. Each day, I choose to listen to the spirit of truth and not my flesh. If I take delight in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart. Means not just I'll get whatever I want. When I say, I love you, God, now give me what I want. Not just I love you, God, now Jesus, genie, here's my you know, special thing. I, I rub the lamp and I get what I want. No, as I delight in the Lord, as I spend time with Him, as His presence and His Spirit fill me, then guess what? As my desires and my delights align with His, God gives me the desires of my heart. His desires become my desires, and now I can follow Him. And He gives me those things that are born, born out of an intimate relationship with Him. Let's move on from what's possible with the Spirit's presence to finish up with what's possible with His power. One of the things Jesus says is we will do the works that Jesus did because of his power. Back to verse 12 of John 14. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Who would do the works Jesus was doing? Those who believe in him. 
What does it mean to believing in Jesus? It means to put your full faith and trust in Him as Savior and Lord, His character, His finished work on the cross. Until and unless that happens, all we might have is just a nice religious life. That's not believing, trusting, knowing Him. Well, if we believe Him, we'll do the works Jesus did. What were those works? He preached the kingdom, the good news. He became its ambassador. He was healing the sick, casting out demons, signs and wonders accompanied everywhere Jesus went. Jesus' mission would become his disciples' mission. And guess what? It's now our mission as well as fellow believers. Can I ask you a tough question? If someone were to look at your life, would they find evidence of the works of Jesus in your life? Does God see the kind of things that Jesus did when he sees us? That's what he promises. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. That's why we're so focused on discipleship here. We want to help you to understand what did Jesus do, but then also, how can I do that? There's nothing more exciting than being on mission with Jesus, doing the things he did. We also stress the balance here between the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. The fruit as exemplified by Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control demonstrates to the world the character of who God is. But then we also have the gifts and the power of the Spirit, the supernatural manifestation, things like healing, like speaking in tongues, like miracles, like prophecy. That demonstrates the power of God to the world. To be effective witness, we can't do it in our own strength. In fact, Jesus said, don't leave the city of Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power from on high. What a great visual. And then Acts 1.8, when he gave his disciples this part of his great commission, how to go, he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We are the ends of the earth. We're part of that advancement of the kingdom because believers before us did the work. Spreading the gospel. Signs and wonders accompany the gospel as it spread. Healing accompany the proclamation of the kingdom. Sadly, the big C, universal church, kind of forgot about the power of God for a long time. Almost a thousand years, it seemed like the power of the Spirit was kind of gone in the earth in a lot of way. But thankfully, over the last hundred years or so, God's power, His presence is with us in a greater way since the Pentecostal and Charismatic revivals of the last hundred years. In fact, some of the fastest growing churches anywhere around the world are all in the Charismatic and Pentecostal traditions today. But not only did Jesus promise they would do the works he did, he makes the second shocking statement in verse 12. He said, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Turn to your neighbor and say, greater things... What are you saying, Dr. Steele? Are you telling me that we are going to do greater things than Jesus himself as the eternal second person of the Trinity? Well, maybe not greater in the sense of the kind of things he did, but greater in terms of its scope? Yes. Jesus lived at one place and one time, walking on the earth for 33 plus years. He didn't travel to China. He didn't travel to South America or here to North America. He was in that small little piece of dirt in the Middle East. But you and I, as part of his greater mission, as part of believers now, we get to see and spread the message and the kingdom of God far beyond just what Jesus himself was able to do. It's a part of his plan. We get to do greater things even than Jesus did. We're on mission with him because Jesus went to the Father. Sending his spirit now, God's spirit goes not just in one body, now potentially the workforce of the kingdom potentially billions of believers. With the Holy Spirit, he goes with me to work at the hospital. With the Holy Spirit, he can go with you into your family, into your neighborhood, onto your kids' sports teams, into your classroom. Greater things is what God calls us to be because of his presence and his power. These manifestations of the Spirit, we don't have time in this setting. Come back Wednesday night, and we're going to actually talk more about the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to leave some room and some time to see some of these gifts operate, to ask God to show up, can't sing about His power and preach about His power, and then not actually provide opportunities 
for God's power to move. Amen? But I want to let you know, as a realist, as a scientist, as a medical doctor, I've seen God do supernatural miracles. I've seen God heal, not through my medicines, but supernaturally through the laying on of hands. I've had God speak supernaturally to me through dreams and visions. I've had prophetic words given to me and given them to others. God's power, God's presence, they are real even today. The question is, to live this greater thing is kind of a Christian life. Do we have the Spirit with us? Do we acknowledge His presence? Maybe you say today, I'm not sure I really sense God's Spirit. I'm not sure how I relate. Have you really believed in Jesus? Have you put your full weight and trust in Him? Because until that happens, the Spirit can't come and take our old heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh. Maybe you've never experienced the miracles of the power of God in your life. Maybe because you just grew up in a church like I did where that was never taught. Or maybe you're afraid that's kind of weird and spooky, this idea of God doing stuff supernatural. I don't know about that. Well, if you never ask, the Bible tells us to eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Can you close your eyes for a second? I'm going to ask some of our worship team to come back up here to just one more time. Let him know that we're desperate for him. But today, if you need to give your life to Jesus, the answer is repent. Carlos preached about it last week. Turn around. Stop going your own way. Trust in Jesus. Turn to God the Father. Accept what Jesus did on your behalf. But maybe for you, it's the idea of you've allowed yourself to be alone. Maybe you're a part of God's kingdom, but you've been separated from his family. Maybe you're not connected in the body. Maybe you're not seeing yourself as what God wants to do. Maybe you're resisting that sanctification process where God says, come as you are, but he won't leave you there. He wants to change us, to grow us, to look more like Jesus, to help us function as greater things kind of Christians. If you've listened to so many other voices or you haven't allowed the truth of God's word, to sp to, you haven't spent time with him, hearing his voice, the answer is also repent. It's all these things. Turn to him. Commit to spend time with him. Get in that word. Because I promise you, God's presence and his power, there is more than you've experienced before. God's presence and his power going before us, God's kingdom will advance. There's nothing greater than we are part of that advancement of his kingdom. Spirit, thank you for your promises. May we live out what you promised us to do for your spirit. It's been better for us that you went. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping us even today apply this word to our life. In Jesus' name.